everybody. Thank you for joining me. I'm William Mitchell Leader, Music Director and Conductor of the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra, and I'm very excited to tell you about our program tomorrow night, Time to Inspire. The program will, I hope, really inspire you with incredible music by Brian Raphael Neighbors, Igor Stravinsky, Cecile Chaminade, and William Grant Still. I want to take a moment to say that um, I'm excited that the orchestra is still pursuing its dedication to um, performing music by underrepresented groups. In fact, the opening piece on the concert and the final piece on the concert tomorrow night are by African American composers. And we're continuing our year long exploration of the music of women composers with music by French composer Cécile Chaminade on the program tomorrow. Great. And also, before we get started, I want to send another shout out to our friends at the Laramie County Library for hosting these events. And uh, they're a terrific partner of the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra. We really appreciate that partnership. Let's hear it for the library. I'm joined this afternoon by our guest artist, who's not a guest, but a regular and wonderful member of the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra, our principal flute, Ismail Reyes. Ismail has been featured in numerous solos and concertos over the seasons, over the years, and we're so excited to feature him again tomorrow. Ismail is here along with his lovely wife. Welcome. <laughs> we will be hearing more from Ismail and hearing uh, his wonderful flute playing later on in this hour. So first I'll talk to you about the other pieces on the program. The Brian Raphael Neighbors piece that opens the work, that opens the concert, is a very short fanfare, like a two-minute musical embodiment of joy and celebration. The composer himself wrote that in this short piece that was part of a commission for the Rocco Chamber Orchestra in Houston, um, he wanted to convey pure musical joy in so many different kinds of ways. There are musical flourishes and there are driving rhythms, because he says, you know, the excitement of driving rhythms is another kind of joy. Here's a little example of the opening of this piece. Conservatory has already had numerous commissions and performances with major orchestras, and I believe he's maybe just barely 30 years old. So he wrote this piece, and it was premiered just in 2019, so it's still relatively fresh, and I think it adds a wonderful sparkle and energy to the beginning of our concert. After that, we're going to perform Stravinsky's wonderful <coughs> Rite of Spring. Gosh, where to begin? I, there's so much to tell you about this piece. The Rite of Spring is perhaps one of the most influential pieces of classical music ever written. Many people say that it changed the course of music in the 20th century after it was written and premiered in 1913. The premiere itself was a kind of uh, legend to itself. It, there was kind of a riot and a scandal in Paris in May of 1913 at the Theatre Champs-Élysées, which was a new theater then. And um, it was part of the Ballet Russe season, so it was presented, kind of, if you will, kind of imagine, alongside works like Scheherazade, Firebird, or pieces by Chopin, and so forth, all staged with beautiful ballet dancers, you know, in very diaphanous kind of uh, costumes or in their tutus, and then all of a sudden was something so different, so unusual with the Rite of Spring. This piece as a ballet has had a hard time of it. The piece has actually been, unusually, more successful as a concert piece, in a sense, from day one. The ballet, um, with original choreography by Nijinsky at the premiere, caused such a scandal because the, the dancers were in these heavy outfits portraying these early pre-civilization Russian 
pagans celebrating the arrival of spring and offering one of the maidens from their tribe as a sacrifice to the god of spring. So that's sort of the bare bones of the plot of the ballet. But the unusual choreography and costumes, which included things like entire um, bear hides or buffalo almost looking hides, something that actually might have gone over well in Wyoming, but not in Paris. Um, but uh, those things were not, you know, the audience couldn't see the dancers' bodies. They were covered in this very primitive kind of sackcloth and thumping on the ground instead of being light as air, as you would expect from ballet. So there was something about the ballet early on that kind of put people off. And even um, as early as 1920, that original choreography, which only had about seven performances um, in different cities, but only seven was very few, actually, for ballet at that time. That choreography was pushed aside, and new choreography was developed in 1920. Over the years, additional new choreography has been developed, but none of them have sort of become, I guess, the choreography of the piece. The earliest choreography, that Nijinsky scandalous choreography, was finally recreated from sketches, notes, diary entries, and, and some you know, pictures that people were drawing, and finally recreated by the Joffrey Ballet in the 1980s, I think it was. And so now we can see what was so scandalous. You know, sometimes the dancers were doing these really unusual things. There was one time where the circle of young maidens were all going like this with their with their cheek, like, you know, head, head against their cheek like this, and somebody at the premiere famously yells, someone call a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the point of what I'm trying to say is that the musical score of this ballet has been the star, in a sense, from day one. In fact, as early as the very next year after the 1913 premiere, this piece was performed in concert and the reception was so overwhelmingly positive that the audience rose to their feet and cheered at the end, and then they came backstage, and according to Stravinsky's memoirs, which might have been embellished, they lifted him up on their shoulders and carried him through the streets in celebration. This was a year after the premiere that was such a scandal that he was scared for his life. He left the audience and went backstage to help Nijinsky scream the numbers as the musician, as the dancers would dance it because so much ruckus in the audience, the, the dancers couldn't hear the music. Okay, so it's strange and interesting that this piece, written as a ballet, has been more successful as a concert piece. That's how we're presenting it tomorrow night. We won't have ballet. But one of the things that I think is so special about seeing it in concert is that the orchestra itself is an unusual star in this piece. The orchestra, it calls for a huge orchestra, and many unusual instruments and instrumental combinations, and instruments asked to do things outside of their normal playing range and styles, maybe even outside of some of their instruments' vernacular, what's comfortable for their instrument. And so to see it on stage, you get to see the spectacle of 95 or 100 musicians highly trained playing incredibly complex rhythms and meters in perfect sync. I actually think it's more visually stimulating to see the orchestra than it is to see the ballet. And I've watched the original choreography and later choreography many times. And it's so interesting to see the choreography. But there's nothing like seeing the orchestra play it and have the orchestra be out of the pit where you can actually see them. So that's going to be a little bit about your experience tomorrow night. We will have a supersized Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra with 95 musicians on stage, and such unusual instruments as the bass trumpet, alto flute, two bass clarinets, two contrabassoons. Instead of the normal one tuba, we have two tubas. And then at one point, some of the horn players are asked to double on an unusual instrument called a Wagner tuba. So we have two Wagner tubas joining the two bass tubas for a sound of four tubas playing at one point. Instead of the normal one timpanist playing about four or five timpani drums, we have two timpanists playing a total of nine drums, including a drum that we had to specially procure because it's unusually high. And that's one of the things that Stravinsky seems to like to do in this piece. He takes instruments that are normally low 
and has them play in their extreme high register. And such is the very beginning of the piece that starts famously with the sound of an instrument that, at its premiere, even the great composer Sassons, who was in the audience, said, what instrument is that? <laughs> Listen to the opening and see if you, I mean, many of you probably know this piece well and you know what instrument it is, but don't give it away for those who will guess. Guess what instrument? Well, the answer is it's a very high bassoon, and it's an extremely challenging and frightening part for the first bassoon player to come in by yourself very quietly on a note that's virtually outside of your range because it's so high, and to try to make it beautiful. Well, at that premiere, apparently somebody next to Sesson said, uh, my show, I believe that's a bassoon. And he apparently said, if that's a bassoon, then I'm a baboon. <laughs> He was from the, you know, romantic style of composer. Anyway, so the bassoon starts it off by him or herself. And this is also interesting because this is one of the few examples of an actual quote of a folk tune in this piece. The, the piece is not especially melodic. It does have some wonderful melodies, but it's all about rhythm, and orchestra colors and sounds. So, but, you know, it is part of that tri triumvirate of great Russian ballets that Stravinsky wrote in quick succession. 1910, Firebird, 1911, Petrushka, and 1913, The Rite of Spring. In fact, the original sketches and original ideas for The Rite of Spring date from 1910. And if you listen, if you know the Firebird and Petrushka, those earlier ballets, um, you can actually hear glimpses of them coming through in the Rite of Spring. There's a section, actually, that um, pretty much almost quotes the Firebird, bum, 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 yeah, in the Rite of Spring. And there are parts in the first part of the Rite of Spring that sound so much like the carnival in Petrushka at times, with bells ringing and so forth. So it is of that era and of that milieu, but the very opening, that bassoon part, is a Lithuanian folk melody that Stravinsky found in an anthology. He was working with a Russian uh, painter and ethnologist and sort of anthropologist named Rory, who designed the sets and came, helped, helped Stravinsky come up with the idea of the ballet, such as it was. The idea of the ballet, just to get back to a little bit to the dancing and the plot, um, there's not a great plot, and that is perhaps another reason why it doesn't succeed as well as a ballet as it does a concert piece. So Stravinsky's initial idea for this piece came as a fleeting vision. He had this vision in 1910 of a circle of old like elders from the pagan tribe circling it's seated around, watching a young maiden of their tribe dance herself to death as an offering to the spring, to the god of spring. And so that was the initial idea of the whole ballet. In fact, the original ballet in its early sketches was called The Sacrifice. And now the ballet, after it was fully developed, it, the, the name of it changed to, in Russian, Holy Spring. But the French and now English version of that name is the Rite of Spring. But in Russian, it translates interestingly as Holy Spring. Um, so now it has two parts. The second part is the sacrifice, the original title for the entire ballet. The first part is the adoration of the earth, where we see, we get to know this tribe, and we see that they're deeply connected with the earth. They love the earth, and there's this glorification of the earth. At one chilling and beautiful moment in the original ballet, in part one, there's this incredible sound and uproar from the orchestra, and the entire tribe is dancing in celebration of the uh, of spring having arrived, and I think it just cuts short, and then there's this silence, and this mysterious moment where this old man, the oldest and wisest one from the tribe, it says in the score, bends down slowly and kisses the earth. 
And that little kiss then leads to some of the most exciting and, and kind of exuberant and kind of ecstatic music in the orchestra and by the dancing of the rest of the tribe. Okay, I'm getting a little off course here. There's so much to tell you about. <laughs> yes, the instrumentation, the origins of the piece is just it's so fascinating. Um, the first five, three or four minutes of the piece are revolutionary in another way. They put aside the strings of the orchestra, which for so long in orchestral music have been the foundation of orchestral music. After all, the string instruments are the oldest instruments, instruments of the orchestra. When orchestra started, it was just strings and harp support. And then eventually we had oboes and horns. And then eventually more and more instruments became developed enough to be added. Clarinets, flutes, trumpets, trombones. Later and later, more and more instruments joined the orchestra, but strings have always been the foundation of it. In perhaps an effort to show that this was a new revolution in music, Stravinsky has the strings sit out almost entirely for the first three or four minutes, and he gives a sort of mini concerto for the woodwind section. And the woodwinds are highlighted by these, well, the unusually high bassoon that starts it, but then they, the two bass clarinets, the piccolo E-flat clarinet, the little clarinet, the alto flute, two piccolos, oboes, and uh, two English horns, two contrabassoons. And so I like to think of this opening as a sort of concerto for woodwinds. You know, sometimes there are concertos for orchestra, and they feature different sections of the orchestra. That's sort of what Stravinsky originated. He was maybe the first to do it with this piece, although he didn't call it that. I also like to think that perhaps there's a programmatic element here. Perhaps these are the spring winds, literally, warming up the frozen and frigid ground of the earth with their air. These wind players, they're providing the wind that's going to maybe awaken the earth along with the sun. Now, of course, I'm very much aware that we're performing the rite of spring in the middle of winter. <laughs> Why are we doing that? Well, you know, we also have a fantastic season finale in April, and this just seemed to be the right place to put it. And one of the reasons is that this time of year is when we do our um, annual education concerts, and we fill the Civic Center two times with fifth and sixth graders, which we did yesterday. And it was so fantastic to be able to give these young students, as for many of them their first orchestral experience, to hear the rite of spring. <laughs> as well as Ismail performing his beautiful concerto, his concertino, and, and the other pieces on the program too. So that worked out really well. But I did want to mention that even though we're in the middle of winter, this piece, it may not make you feel like spring, but I think it might get you ready for the energy of spring, for the exuberance of spring, for that excitement that we get when we see those buds coming out. So it has a few like folk tunes in it, but as I said before, it's really about rhythm. Here's uh, when the strings finally do come in on, in a, a forceful way, they have a famous part. And this is actually the first part where the curtain would rise in the ballet. Many people don't realize that. In the ballet, the entire opening with the woodwinds that I talked about is with the curtain down. The curtain doesn't raise until the strings come in with this incredible thumping part. Let's see if I can find it. No, it's back after that. Sorry. I don't, I don't have a hard time seeing something here. One second. <laughs> this part. So the curtain rises, you see some ballet dancers completely covered head to foot in a sort of a sackcloth of the door like this. And then you have these unusual accents that follow no pattern. But still, even with the bassoons and hobos here, there's a hint of Petrushka in here. If you know that ballet well, you'll kind of hear this in here. Yes, that loud timpani entrance there reminds me that one of the things that I love about this piece, and I think a lot of the musicians also love about it, is that there are times where the music is very delicate and refined, 
And as orchestra musicians, we're constantly called upon to play with extreme finesse, right? Extreme refinement, whether it be in articulation, note length, tuning of a note. You know, these are extremely highly trained musicians. The thing that is so incredible about this piece is that it allows these highly trained musicians to play with savage abandon and sa just savage ferocity. That's what this piece also has in it. And then I think it's that combination of refinement and that sort of like extreme, sort of like savage, almost bestial kind of kind of feeling to it is one of the things that is just so electrifying about this piece. And it's also so interesting that there's also the opposite inherent in the piece that it's trying to depict these ancient pagan uh, Russian pagans, but yet it's so extremely modern sound. Actually, you know, the thing about the ancient Russian pagans was not unique to that time. When this premiered in 1913, there were many other pieces of symphonic music, ballet, and art that were exploring this kind of idea of getting back to primitive roots. We had come through the high point of, you know, romanticism and refinement, and composers like Schoenberg, uh, Debussy, and um, Prokofiev, early Shostakovich, were exploring the ideas, these ideas of, you know, maybe there's, maybe we've taken refinement and romanticism to the extremes. Maybe we need to go back to earlier times. Like, there was a fascination with Scythians, the Scythian nomadic warriors. There was a fascination with them and their culture. And so, in a way, the Rite of Spring came out of this um, kind of new trend in, in Paris and in other parts of Europe at that time. Um, and it's also interesting that all of these artists and composers were in a sense also kind of anticipating the arrival of World War I and the Russian Revolution. It's almost as if war was in the air and some sort of cataclysmic event that we couldn't, that they knew that somehow this couldn't be sustained was in the air. And that was inherent in their art or music. And that's certainly the case in part one of the Rite of Spring, where it's supposed to be all about the glorification of the earth, right? There are parts that sound like war. And it's, it's so interesting. So this comes at a time much like even Gustav Holst with the planets which opens, of course, famously with Mars, the rumor of war. This also was around 1915. This piece, the writer's Spring, 1913. These pieces sensed that World War I was coming and great upheaval. Let me give you an example of some of that warlike art. In this score, it's talked about as the rival tribes that are, you know, um, sort of contentious with each other, but it sounds very warlike. Let's see if I can find it. No, that's, that's another different part. That's a different. <laughs> I gotta talk about that. I'll be back. Okay, this is a part called the Ritual of Abduction. And this really does sound like an abduction. There's scariness here. Some people have faulted the ballet for not having enough character development and emotion in the ballet itself. Well, I can tell you there's a lot of fear <laughs> in the music. Now after all this intensity, 
those four tubas I tell you, told you about, come in with a melody on the bottom of all this ruckus that will eventually take over. This part, in a sense, almost has a Trishko gone wild. This was a revelation. Uh, Stravinsky was actually taken to an exotic musical, Latin American musical instrument shot by Ravel, and he discovered this piece. And we're about to come up to the part where the guiro makes an entrance, and for our performances, what is done oftentimes these days, because the guiro isn't loud enough to cut through, um, we use a tin washboard. So we're going to have two tin washboards back there playing the guiro part, which is an unusual counter rhythm with everybody. Um, Yes, there's just so much to talk about this exciting piece. As I'm giving you these images and background, I'm worried that part of me is actually kind of dashing some of your early images of this piece. For those of you who know this music well, you might know it from the movie Fantasia, which had a beautiful, wonderful depiction of volcanoes erupting and the earth being formed in dinosaurs. And that was the just artist's depiction of what they thought was going on here. Um, that wasn't necessarily the story of the ballet at all. But I mean, it did have to do with pre-civilization pagans, but not necessarily volcanoes and the creation of the Earth itself. But it does celebrate the Earth, this piece. Of course, you know, because we're presenting it without the ballet, this could mean anything to any of you, and it could hopefully mean many different things to each of our listeners in the audience. It does have two big sections, like two movements of the symphony. So there's a pause in between. When I catch my breath, <laughs> literally, and uh, the orchestra kind of, <sighs> um, the one of the interesting things about part two is that at the very end of the whole thing, the end of the second movement, if you will, is the most challenging part, and it's the part of the actual sacrifice where the chosen maiden from the tribe would dance herself to death if this was a ballet rendition of it. Um, before that, you get music of, you know, an unusual kind of mysterious color. It sounds very much like outer space. I wondered if this piece came before the planets, because when I heard it, it sounded like Holst's Neptune. Just listen to this opening of the second part. As I mentioned just a few moments ago, Holst's Neptune and the rest of his planets came two years later. I don't know if, he's heard, if he heard this at the time. familiar with the whole so probably were right away like, oh yeah, that sounds just like we're in outer space again with Gustav Holst. So this part has in the opening, it's almost like it's supposed to be nighttime and it starts with a calmer sense. There's this fleeting sort of eerie high melody in harmonics and the strings. And then it comes back. It's just little glimpses of a melody, but it's otherwise it's just sort of setting the stage for something. But I tossed it just before the orchestra comes in with this amazing sound, a very low kind of arrival that has a sense of kind of like groundedness to the earth again. Listen to this. Made quite as well over these speakers, but there's a bass drum in there and timpani, and they have this low kind of sense of. Ooh. 
This movement also starts with a long section of the curtain down in the original ballet. This whole opening has the curtain down. Eventually, there's, um, the curtain rises and we see a, a group of young maidens. They haven't chosen the one to be sacrificed yet. They do a sort of round dance, and the music sounds, again, more like, like a folk song. But then all of a sudden, there's an interruption with the brass, where you hear, Bada, where one of the maidens falls out of the circle. And they were like, uh-oh, that might mean she's the chosen one. She gets back up, and they dance a little bit more, and then you hear, Bada, and then again, that confirms it. She's the chosen one. Then the music has an incredible accelerometer, we call it in music, where it gets faster and faster and faster, like the accelerator. Um, and so there's an accelerando of excitement, and then this brutal 11 4 measure, where the orchestra just plays bam, 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 11 times. In terms of musical meter, for those of you who are musically trained, I know many of you are, it's probably the only 11 4 in music. It certainly was the first um, in terms of meter. And after that, in the ballet, that chosen one realizes her fate. She stands motionless in the middle of the stage for about 15 minutes through the next several dances, some of which are very wild, some of which are sort of calmer. And she stays completely still until it's time for her to dance the final dance, which is that last section, like I may have mentioned earlier, which is maybe the hardest part of the orchestra, rhythmically. Um, the music after that 11th floor is. Oh, right there. All right. Let me see if I can find it. <laughs> That's it. Okay. I'm going to back up. You'll hear the da da when she falls out now. And then. Oh, that's the first one. She fell down. Get back up. Maybe it won't be you. Maybe you're not going to be the chosen one. So there's about 20, maybe 15 maidens circling in a circle now. She falls down again. The same one. She's the chosen one. You can sense the excitement for the rest of the tribe, but also the fear for her. This is the 11th floor mark. We have constant shifts between 5 8, 7 8, 7 4, 9 8. Um, it's just incredible. Rhythmically, there was nothing like this before the times. Nothing. It's just so revolutionary. And revolutionary brings up another interesting connection. I find that there's a connection between Stravinsky and Beethoven, specifically Beethoven's Eroica Symphony, which was so revolutionary. Both pieces were written at a time of political and cultural change, political revolutions. Both pieces actually have a kind of sense of a young composer trying to prove themselves, trying to change the musical world, trying to usher in a new era. What Beethoven did in 1803 and what Stravinsky did in 1913 were almost musical and cultural equivalents of putting away a whole chapter, in Beethoven's case of classicism, on to romanticism. In Stravinsky's case, putting away the chapter of romanticism on to modernism. There's also an interesting connection between these two pieces because in the first movement of the Eroica Symphony by Beethoven, there's a moment of incredible harshness for the time um, in the development section, followed by a very strong um, passage of actually 11 chords where the strings play bum, 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 And then it leads to Sorry about my singing, but for those of you who know the Eroka, you know which part I'm talking about now. And maybe you didn't make that connection before. But I think Stravinsky tried to emulate that. That moment that was so revolutionary in Beethoven's Third Symphony of 1803, 
to do that in its, his own way in 1913 with that same kind of ferocity um, and then taking it to a whole new level. The piece continues, and I'll give you a little sample of what the sacrificial dance sounds like at the end. It's something that Stravinsky himself said, you know, I could play it at the piano when I was writing the piece, but I didn't know how to write it down. That's how complex the rhythms are, the meters are. In fact, in 19, um, gosh, I think it's 1945, he came out with a whole new revised version of this final dance, the Don Sacral, the final section, that completely changed the meters. He was trying to make it easier. Well, he just confused everybody. Nobody uses that revision. <laughs> so this is what the final part sounds like. This is the part that's a real showpiece for the chosen one in a ballet. There's one ballet, ballet dancer who dances herself to death in the story, and um, she is the star of the ballet. Curiously, by the way, at the American premiere of the ballet, that part was danced by Martha Graham. That was 1930, before she was well known for developing her own style, her own dance company, and her own modern style, that was grounded in the earth, just like this piece. Interesting. Okay, so here's what it sounds like. Actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to back up. This is music that's sort of painting up. In the ballet, slowly most of the tribe leaves the stage. You can kind of get a sense that it's quieting down after it was a big ruckus. There are signs in this piece that are so overwhelming and loud that moments like this of calm and quiet are really special. But here comes the beginning of that dance. So that chosen one has been sitting here like this, frozen, until this moment. Too long about this, I knew I would. 
I wanted to have enough time to tell you about the Afro-American Symphony before bringing up Ismael uh, to tell us about the Shamanad and to learn more about him and his flute playing. I'll just say it in a, in a brief sort of nutshell. One of the things that's so wonderful about William Grant Still's Afro-American Symphony is that in many ways it's so American. It's not just Afro-American, it's American. It's quintessentially American. He uses the blues and he uses instruments like banjo and vibraphone. And he has the music inspired by poetry, by Afro-American poet Paul Dunbar. And he creates this symphony that is really, in a sense, the great American symphony. I also am amazed at his courage for writing this piece in 1930, being the first African American to write a symphony for orchestra, took courage. And then to have that performed and, and actually title it the Afro-American Symphony, that took courage. It also took courage at that time, and this goes directly to what I was saying about Stravinsky and emotion. At that time, in 1930, it was still not considered appropriate to have too much emotion in your music, you know? Um, certainly we have like Gershwin and other styles of music, but among the composition avant-garde, you know, this piece is courageously heartfelt and courageously full of emotion and passion. The first woman has a subtitle of longing. Um, in an interesting little connection, to the Rite of Spring, both pieces start with a solo double reed woodwind playing in a very high register. In the case of the Stravinsky, I mentioned it was the bassoon. In this case, it's a solo English horn playing all by herself, way up high, and then ushering in muted trumpet playing a blues melody. The banjo eventually comes in in the third movement, and it's, it's a wonderful little addition, but um, I think it was. Getting back to what I was saying, I think it was courageous of Still to write this piece, to try to elevate the blues. He said that too many think people think that the blues is a lowly art form, and it isn't. So he was trying to show that the blues could even be in a symphony. That took courage. And then to, to you know, he's a very deeply spiritual man. Every, every score he wrote ends with, with humble thanks to God, whose inspiration, you know, this. I, I'm, I'm, I have a score right here. Every score has this in it. With humble thanks to God, the source of inspiration. In this score, he also goes on to say, he who develops his God-given gifts with view to aiming humanity manifests truth. So there's so much to this piece, so much heart in it. The, the last movement is really an incredible part where it's, it's all about aspiration and kind of looking to the future, and ah, it's just amazing. I will also mention that in the third movement, which is fun and light and full of religious fervor, it's like a sh musical shout hallelujah. In this, there's a little sub-melody that you will recognize. It sounds like, I've got rhythm, I've got rhythm. <laughs> Gershwin, right? Gershwin's Girl Crazy, from which that melody comes, was on Broadway, roughly at the time that this piece was written. But people said that they know that William Grant Still was writing that and played it for Gershwin before Girl Crazy was written. <laughs> so isn't that interesting? They knew each other. And maybe Gershwin stole it. We don't know. We don't know. But that's what people said. Well, I'm excited to welcome up our soloist for the concert, our wonderful principal flute, Ismael Reyes, to tell us about himself and this beautiful concertino by Cecile Chaminade, perhaps a composer you've never heard of. Every flute player has heard of it. Please welcome Ismael Reyes. <laughs> But most regular people, even regular classical music fans, don't know her name. But she was an important French composer. Tell us a little bit about what you know of her. Yeah. Um, can you hear? Yeah. Me? Yeah. 
Um, she actually, um, she was a precautious uh, pianist, actually, and she wanted to uh, play music, and she wanted to pursue music as a career, and um, she and her father actually didn't want her right. to do music for that. She at all. Yeah, and she, uh, she actually couldn't. Uh, it was only after uh, George Bizet, a uh, famous composer from the Opera Department, uh, that encouraged her and convinced her family to let her uh, take lessons, actually. She went on to study uh, piano, and she became a very accomplished uh, piano player, but she didn't pursue music um, uh, seriously until her father's death. And uh, she was, just like we were mentioning about uh, William Grant Steele, she was also a very courageous uh, figure uh, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century because she decided to go on with it. And uh, she actually became a very famous concert uh, pianist uh, throughout Europe. And um, this piece, the concertino, like William was saying, it's for us, is it's kind of like the national anthem of, of <laughs> first players. players. Yeah. Everybody knows it, everybody plays it, everybody wants to play it. Uh, you saw the video I recorded for uh, the orchestra's uh, Facebook page. Uh, as, as soon as I listened to this piece for the first time, I just wanted to learn it. I was, it was a recording that my teacher gave me uh, by the famous Blue player Sir, Sir James Galway. Uh, and this was when you were 11 yeah, years old. I was 11. I was just growing up in Venezuela. Exactly. Growing up in Venezuela. And I was just starting to, to play the flute. And there weren't scores available. So I just like was trying to learn the piece. By ear? Yeah. Oh, wow. Because it's, it's, it's just such a pretty piece. It's just very, very beautiful. And I'm very excited now that I just have the opportunity to play and like I just gotten so many comments from, from the orchestra members uh, this week and everybody's just telling me, Oh I love this piece when I was with Bromla, my sister played the flute and, was, <laughs> and so it's everybody loves it. So it's I, so like if you're coming to I think you will too. It's it's very exciting, it's very, very beautiful, it's full of like Sumptuous melodies. And it's so luscious. It's, it's, it's a very, very. It has a great like combination of lyricism and virtuosity. Yeah. And it's not virtuosity for virtuosity's sake. It really grows to that point. Yeah. And it is a concertino. It's a small concerto. It's all in one movement, basically. Uh, but there's a cadenza, like you would expect in a first movement concerto. I wanted to share a great comment that I heard from one of the musicians in the orchestra yesterday. He said. William, it's so great to actually hear the shamanad not played by a high school flute player. <laughs> and to hear it with orchestra, not with piano. Because some of these musicians, you know, they hear it all the time. It's like they're judging juries and different things. They're hearing, you know, junior high people playing this with piano. But here we have an uh, outstanding I, I actually got the same comment from one yeah. flute player of, of the second say, Oh, this is so awesome to hear a mature performance of, of this piece. Right, but it's, it's really a wonderful piece, and she she wrote it in uh, <coughs> a time that music for flute was changing, um, because this uh, instrument wasn't designed until the middle of the 19th century. Um, uh, the creator or the inventor, this uh, Theobald Dunn, yeah, and he he patented. This design in, like, in 1847. So, at the how did that change from the earlier design? Because they were still played like this, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Not like we're talking about the change from recorder style to transversal. No, that was the Baroque era. No, this is just an update to the whole mechanisms of it. Yeah. So the flute, it was different in different ways. Um, the head was it used to be cylindrical and the body was conical. Oh, wow. So that limited the range quite a bit, and that had been the design from uh, the early 1700s. Wow. Now, he changed it to a conical head and cylindrical body that allowed the flute to, to play in a much bigger range, 
And he had like, all these rods uh, that connected different keys, like which you probably can't see from there, but if I move this key, is activating this key over here. Yeah, so from here the tuning and that. Tuning and just the ability to play different keys. So at the time, the music, uh, like right after this, this design was developed, the composer wanted to show what the flute could do. So pretty much everything that we got in flute repertoire from 1950 to the late uh, 1800s was showpiece music. Yeah. It just it sounded kind of like this. I'm just going to play an excerpt of piece by um, Johann Joachim uh, Anderson, a uh, Danish uh, flutist who was actually um, one of the original members of the Berlin Philharmonic. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, and in everything that we have from that period sounds something like this. several holes and people were adding keys here and there, there wasn't like a unified system for the instrument. And that revolutionized the music for, for the instrument. He himself wanted to prove to, and his music sounds like that too. But at the same time, composers were starting to notice, oh, this instrument can actually do more than that. And that's when BBC wrote uh, a very famous uh, flute solo, Prelude of the Afternoon of the Pond. Yeah. Um, and they, so that was in like 1898, 1898 or 1894, somewhere around. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Debussy was also a for, you know, front runner in saying, okay, but the flute could do more than just technical virtuosity now, people. And somehow that started something in Paris, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe Debussy wasn't the first, but then there became a whole thing. And yeah. So Chaminade is mean, part of that. Yeah, and Chaminade wrote this piece uh, in 1902 for Paul Tappanel, which was probably the earliest adopter of, of, of this instrument out of like the, the famous uh, flute players. Um, she wrote in a new style. You, you can tell like the music is much more lyrical, is like you said, equally virtuosic, uh, but it has a much more uh, musical meaning to it rather than just showing what the instrument can do. Yeah. Uh, for example, I'll, I'll you can play the, the, yeah. of the, beginning, the, the very opening of the piece, you can hear the melody is so beautiful and so, I don't know, I just love playing this. <laughs> Yeah, sure, like the middle of, after all this lyrical part, 
and we go into uh, the middle section, uh, which is called Tempo Vivo, and it's very, very exciting to play. Oh, and it introduces the harp, another very different instrument, so it has this beautiful harp flute interaction. Pretty much everybody who came out of like the 1930s on, 
to the time and place when the Rite of Spring was written. So it's fascinating to compare these two completely different musical pieces and musical personalities that were both in Paris and then these two pieces were written just 10 years apart. So it's fascinating. Um, now, where does the French flute school fit into your story as a young flutist from Venezuela growing up in El Sistema and then doing graduate work in the United States? Do you identify with the French flute? Very much so, because my teacher, uh, or like the main teacher I had uh, throughout you know, my studies, was a student of Raymond Gill in France, who was a student of Moïse. Wow. Uh, and actually, he uh, trained all his students in the way like Moïse taught, and, sure. and he made us practice scales and arpeggios, like tons of exercises. And, I remember just like spending hours every day because if you showed up to your lesson and you couldn't play the scales on your pages, you wouldn't listen to anything else. Wow. So the beginning of the lesson, you had to play that first. And if you wanted to play your repertoire and your etudes, you had to learn that. Otherwise, he would say, okay, you didn't learn that, you can go home. <laughs> and, uh, so that actually, where pretty much those four years, five years I studied with him where I, I feel, you know, my entire technique and then since then it's been like pretty much maintenance. And the way I practice now is still pretty much the way I practice when I was in the old style of that. So in a way, Moise is almost like your musical grandfather, yeah. pedagogical. Yeah. Great grandfather. Great grandfather. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is, as you described it, we talked about the French flute school of playing. It sounds like it's very much focused on technique. But yeah. we talked earlier about the French flute school of composing, like Debussy and Chaminade, which did away with those show pieces that were all about technique. Why yeah, is that? because for them, if you couldn't like master the instrument, master the technique of the instrument, and it's not only just technique. I mean, you're supposed to play, to be able to play that with beautiful tone without like, forcing anything. Um, it, for them, especially a little bit after that, like with, with Guillaume and a very famous, uh, another famous uh, French flute player, uh, player named Alain Marion, who also started the Paris Conservatory, uh, they say this is the foundation. Like, this is how you can like forget about the instrument and focus on like, playing beautifully because if you are dealing with technical issues, you really that's that's what's gonna be in the forefront of, of your playing. So no, you have to, yeah, you have to be able to control the instrument so you can actually uh, express it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh that's so interesting. Yeah. This has been so fascinating. Do you have some questions for Ismail? I know we are slightly over time, and I understand if some of you have places to go if you need to take off those of you in the room. And uh, I do want to give a shout out to everybody who's watching on the on the live stream. Thank you. We're watching this after the fact. 
But we have this great opportunity to have our wonderful friend and virtuoso Ismail here. Any questions for Ismail, who's playing, I'm sure you've admired and adored over the years playing with the symphony. Yes. Ismail. Yes. Yes, I actually have an always blue domain. I always carry it with me. So something that I always try to think like me. about, in addition to the uh, afternoon of the fall in Debussy, there's also this wonderful 
uh, flute solo the Syrinx, which comes from a little bit later, like 1913, 14, yeah. same year as where I was from 1913. Did you, were you willing to play just a little bit of Syrinx?